This is My Big Story with Christopher Swan. Each week, I talk with amazing people to learn about their big story and to find out how they're creating a life that they love. On a rather spur-of-the-moment request, Daniel Trust and I met in downtown Oakland, California, so I could hear his story. In our interview, you'll hear why it was so spur-of-the-moment. But truthfully, I wasn't sure what to expect when meeting him in person. Daniel's a young man that started a nonprofit to help youth with education, specifically youth that are either refugees to the United States, impacted by lower income, or part of the LGBTQ community. But that's not his entire story. Daniel is also a survivor of the Rwanda genocide, losing his father, two sisters, and witnessing his mother's death, leaving him orphaned at age five and he had many difficult years following that trauma. So I was meeting a man that has suffered a horrific childhood, but found a way to forgive and thrive in America. I couldn't really imagine how this was even possible to put my mind around it. But then I met Daniel. He's warm, full of compassion, and ready to tackle anything. In our interview, we talk about his experiences in Rwanda, coming to the US as a teenager, how support from his teachers made all of the difference in his current world with the Daniel Trust Foundation and how and why he needs to give back. I left that interview with a new understanding of hope, perseverance, and very happily and most importantly, with a new friend. Everyone, meet Daniel. can't believe that we made this happen in a week we did (laughs) this is amazing can i i just want to share it yeah because i think this is completely unusual for my show and i think the listeners would love this we talked on skype what eight days ago right and we were planning to do the interview that way yes we were having some technical difficulties that went on for a bit and between you and I, we it almost like flipped the coin, really. But we decided one of us was traveling to go do this. Right. <laughs> and then later that day, you texted me and said, okay, I have a flight. I'll yeah. see you next week. Yeah, I literally just went online, asked my friend if I could stay at his house. And yeah, I bought the ticket and here I am. Now we're sitting in Oakland, California. <laughs> In this yeah. conference room that I have rented. Right. It's it's like, that's the beauty of life. You just got to do things as, yeah. you know, be spontaneous and just go with the flow. And uh, that's what I'm all about. I'm about with making things happen. Yeah. yeah. Cle- clearly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I right. love that. This right. is so amazing. So what a great start. We're going to jump into this now. Yeah. So at an early age, um, you know, life changed for you yes. in, a, in a very big way. And it forced you to flee your country. Yes. And if we flash forward to now, though, you're advocating and helping, like, I'm going to say youth in need. Yes. And you're hoping to inspire people and change lives of others. I want to know first, going back to that beginning, um, what happened to you to force you to leave your country? So I'm originally from Rwanda, born and raised in a small town called Gisenyi. Mm -hmm. And... um, uh, in 1994, we had a terrible war that occurred, and my family was impacted by it. Um, long story short, uh, I ended up losing my mom and dad and two sisters, mm-hmm. and um, the war killed between 800,000 to a million people, lost their lives. Many of the people in Rwanda uh, lost their families, their belongings, their houses were burned. My house was actually burned. I hope the the Terrible people who went into our home, stole our belongings, and put our house on fire. And uh, so grew up as an orphan and uh, lived in a refugee camp. We had to flee to go to a nearby country uh, called the Congo and uh, came back to Rwanda after the war. Um, Lived with a family relative that was very abusive, that called me names and... uh, uh, you know, they told me that I was stupid, that I would never do anything with myself. And, uh, you know, was going through so much ho- at home. And when I would go to school as well, the kids would bully me because I uh, played with girls and I was very flamboyant. And uh, 
uh, it was just a very, very tough uh, childhood. But uh, uh, through it all, I always had hope. And, you know, you always uh, have to have faith, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, once I started realizing that I had survived the Rwandan genocide and that I had life and um, I started thinking that there was something greater out there for me. Uh, when I was about 11 years old, I got the opportunity to uh, leave Rwanda and go to another country called Zambia. And that's where I first learned how to speak English. Because in Rwanda, we speak uh, two languages, well, three now. Uh, at the time growing up, we spoke Kenya Gwanda and also French. So when I went to Zambia, I was 11, uh, didn't know anyone there, lived there for four years. And uh, in 2005, when I was 15, I finally came to uh, the United States. I landed in Bridgeport, Connecticut. You were the survivor out of the family. How did you survive? Yeah, that's a very good question. So during the war, during the Rwandan genocide, when um, killings would happen, uh, people in the community will often come to watch. So my father was Hutu, and my uh, mom was Tutsi. And uh, so what would happen is uh, we were hiding at a church, and when the killers arrived, they asked everyone to come out, and they started killing everyone. And uh, my mom's turn came. Uh, she, they killed her. That's actually the last image I have of her, her being beaten to death right there. But... There was a gentleman who was there, who was Hutu, who uh, took me to his house and hid me. Uh, now, they could have killed me because at the time they were killing all um, Hutu. So they didn't have mercy, whether you were a child and so forth. Many women were raped and uh, uh, just lots of terrible things happened. So this gentleman, as I usually said that uh, the higher powers used him to save me. Um, saw me, I was standing there, and he took me, and he hit me with other people he was hiding. Not all Hutus at the time, because, I, I mean, I'm not going to give a big history of the Rwanda genocide. People can just look it up. Sure. But uh, uh, not all Hutus were bad. Many of us who survived, survived because the Hutu hit us. Um, and uh, so he hit me until he put me on a track to go to a nearby country, the Congo, and where I reunited with some of my family members. Yeah. When you think about just surviving in that, like, as you mentioned, maybe it was the higher power, you know, working through this, this man. I mean, do you reflect back on that now as an adult with, with your purpose and think about maybe that was why it was meant to be or that, that that happened and it gave you a chance to find something. Yeah. Like how are they connected for you? Right. I think, Throughout my life, uh, there's always been that angel, <laughs> that angel that stepped in and uh, helped me. Um, like the, the gentleman came and saved me and hid me. Um, after uh, the genocide happened, when we came back to Rwanda, a relative of mine took me in. It wasn't a perfect life uh, that I had with him, but uh, he gave me an opportunity to have a bed and have uh food and so forth and uh and when i went to zambia i lived with at least four different families i lived with a family from nigeria from the congo from zambia uh, the first person who told me how to drive was a woman from zambia whom again they just took me in because i didn't have anywhere to go and i think my experiences for sure have being helped has shaped who I am now. And I feel like it's my duty to make sure that I pay it forward and that you know somebody did something for me and I have to do that as well. Do you reflect back on that time when you were living with those different families and those those influences? Or how do you reflect back and, and how do you think of that time? Yeah, um, I do reflect a lot, and uh, as I said, I um, usually I have good memories of most of my experience, but also lots of bad experiences. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and with the human nature, you know, we remember most the negative experiences, so even though we have both. Um, I reflect a lot, and uh, through all the experiences, I try to find a positive and. Uh, those experiences, so I think, uh, you know, many of the good things. Oh my God, I can't believe I'm, <laughs> I'm tearing up as I talk about this. Sorry. <laughs> no? 
Um, but yeah, I, I, I do think a lot about my experiences and I learned a lot through all the journeys and uh, um, it's usually very painful uh, to remember. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, because those experiences have taught me um, things I don't want to do to others. So if I was put in a position to support another person or help somebody, I wouldn't want to do certain things just because I didn't like them when they were done to me. Mm-hmm. Um, so I do reflect a lot and I try to, because my before I came to America 12 years ago, my life is filled with negative experiences. Um, I try to balance it with the positive as well. well let's jump in to your your journey to America. You arrived at 15. Yes. You landed at Bridgeport, Connecticut, which you are in today. And from there, you started high school. And um, through that journey, you started to obviously adapt and learn. And um, what was that like coming to America? Did you wonder what you were in for? Were you looking forward to it? Yeah, I... uh once I realized that I had two sisters in America, uh, I said, I need to be there. <laughs> I'm going to be there. And uh, so I always envisioned myself being in America. Uh, although the America that I envisioned myself being is not the America that I came to. <laughs> uh, How so? How is it different? Yeah. Um, so, you know, in Africa, uh, we watch reality TV and we watch um entertainment and so forth, movies. And I think for me as a kid, I thought that's how my life would be. Uh, so I thought I would come when I first got here, my sister would have a big mansion like the Kardashians and mm. everybody on reality TV at the time. MTV Cribs was a big thing at the time. Um, and uh, But that wasn't that. That wasn't the reality. The reality is my sister had um, a simple home, a simple car, and she had a regular job. And uh, uh, But I quickly adapted. Um, my English was still shaky when I first arrived, and also my education background from, um, from the time I was, from the time I could remember, uh, I never thought that I was smart. Uh, so I went straight into ninth grade when I came here, and freshman and sophomore was very tough. I got like a bunch of Fs and Ds and so forth. Uh, but uh, sophomore, senior, uh, junior year, and senior year, I worked really hard. I would go to see my teachers after school to get extra help in math, science, or, uh, and all that other subjects, and started performing better. Um, it took me a while to adjust, uh, and it was also very interesting because teachers were very kind, very. Um, loving and they were willing to stay after school to help me with my homework and so forth and they cared did Um, did that surprise you it surprised me a lot yes because you know growing up in Kisenyi in Rwanda we got whooped for getting (laughs) um, questions wrong on math and I was never smart well I was always smart I think it just there was no one there to tell me that I was um, so I finally people like my teachers here was like, Daniel, you can do this. You can do it. And, uh, it's so, uh, interest. I don't know the exact words to use, but, uh, when you can tell someone that they can do it, that you believe in them, they can actually do it. Mm-hmm. And that's what many of my teachers did. And I ended up, uh, you know, for the very first time I started playing sports, Joined a volleyball team, uh, became team captain my junior year and senior year, won MVP. My, I've had, I never really loved sports, but I became really good, uh, became senior vice president of, uh, uh, senior vice president, yeah, and I got involved in other activities at school, something that I've never envisioned myself doing, but I was doing for the first time. How does that change the way that you look at the world now, having those experiences versus what you had as a child? Uh, it's made me appreciate things. I'm very, very thankful for my life, for uh, everything, you know, for the resources that we have in the United States. Uh, and it's, you know, I remember growing up in Rwanda, I used to walk a long miles to get to school. But when I came here, I was only working, walking to school for 
uh, five, ten minutes I was there. And um, here in high school, we had breakfast uh, and uh, we also had lunch. Um, and I didn't have to pay to go to school. I mean, my sister and her husband paid taxes, but it's not like we, they had to pay school tuition fees. In no wonder, I remember multiple times when I had to be kicked out of school because I didn't pay uh, tuition fees. And uh, if you went to the public school, the, it's not like the best schools ever. Um, so I'm very, very thankful uh, for my life. How were you able to get past the things that happened when you were young in how did you work through that right. to be where you're at today? Yeah, so I think one of the major things that have played a key role in being who I am today and being uh, happy and smiling and not so angry at the world for everything that has happened to me was uh, letting go of the past. So I, I'm thankful that for at an early age, I was able to realize that uh, carrying in, Carrying on bag, uh, baggage from the past or bad things was not going to take me anywhere. So I started to practice forgiving, forgiving myself, um, because a lot of times I thought I was the problem. But many, in most cases, I was not a problem. I was just happened to be there. And uh, so forgiving myself and really telling myself that it was not my fault that this happened. And also I started a process of forgiving those people who had done me wrong. So from the people who murdered my parents, from the people who um, abused me when I was younger, from all the kids that bullied me and so forth. So I started uh, creating this uh, world of positivity uh, and uh, so forgiveness allowed me to do that so letting go of the past and making peace with the fact that my mom and dad and sisters and many thousands of Rwandans have had lost their lives making peace with that that has happened in you there's nothing you can do to change that but what are you going to do now what are you going to do now to make this world a better place um, so that keeps me going yeah I think there was a theme here that you know you you want to give back, you want to do more, you want to, because of the experiences that you have of coming to the States. So you started a foundation. Yes. And this foundation of yours is helping uh, refugees. And this is all youth, I think, right? Right. Ref so, refugees, um, low, low income, income yes. and also LGBT youth. Um, tell me about the foundation, what you guys actually do. Absolutely. Uh, so I started the Data Trust Foundation where the idea started when I was in college. But it came into, it became reality in 2014. But our mission is to support students who are from low-income communities with education and professional goals, and to also honor teachers who go above and beyond to help these students succeed. Why did you want to do this? Um, so there are two reasons why I wanted to do uh, the work that I do now. One is for personal reasons. Uh, you know, when I first got here, there was a community organization called the Bridgeport Public Education Fund that really invested in me. They provided me a mentor. Uh, when I graduated from high school, I was I got a laptop from them, and also mm -hmm. they helped me get a scholarship. It was like a ten thousand dollars scholarship to go to uh, college. And uh, uh, and the second reason is there's a greater need in the community where I'm from for our programs and services, and it's been wonderful to be able to see young people join the program, uh, not so sure about themselves, but graduate knowing who they are, what they want to do. At least they have a vision. They, they, they The support we provide them is uh, helps them kind of see the, the long-term mm -hmm. goal and uh, the journey. We have uh, three programs, a high school mentoring program for high school juniors and seniors, a college scholarship program, and teacher recognition program. So students, we recruit students their junior year and they participate in a 15-week ACT prep. Mm. Uh, because when you think about it, ACT uh, results helps students get into better colleges and also kind of helps them with math and uh, English. And uh, the senior year, we focus on doing college applications, applying for scholarships, doing a resume, and getting their first uh, job opportunities. And once they finish our mentoring program, when they graduate from high school, they become scholarship recipients. So they receive a $2,000 scholarship that is paid over uh, four years. And uh, 
we have a big uh, dinner in June. It's called the Dinner Trust Awards, where the students who are receiving the scholarship get to honor and recognize an educator or a teacher who has impacted their lives. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been amazing. Started with just me honoring my teacher, Kathy Silva, from high school. Uh, Why her? Her. So she was um, my arts teacher, photography, and uh, also did a yearbook with her. But she went above and beyond for all of us. Many of us didn't, weren't really familiar with American culture. So she would like invite us to her house on Thanksgiving and she would take us to New York City to uh, visit different museums. And, you know, she would take us horse riding and she just like was an amazing, I remember prom time, I didn't have any money and she wrote me a check for a hundred dollars to go buy my suit and so forth. She would drive, she'd give us rides at home. And she was just like, an, an amazing person. And um, and when I went to college, she kept in touch with me. I remember when I went to study abroad in France, uh, sophomore year, she let me borrow her expensive Nikon camera. <laughs> and uh, so when I started, um, when I was working at, at the bank, um, I had saved money and I was like, I could do something, I could do something for her. So I started the Cathy Silver Award. I created an award in her honor. And uh, took the thousand dollars from my savings account. I was like, here, thank you so much for everything that you've done for me. <laughs> so oh, that, that that's launched, out of your savings account. I love that. Yeah, that launched the whole thing. I, I want to ask a, a little bit more deeper about some of the students or the the area of focus. Yeah. So we talked about it was refugee, yes. which to me makes a lot of sense talking to you, you right. know, from your background in history right. and the, the low income that, it makes sense with with the um, I think just with what you had noticed right yeah. in your community. Mm-hmm. Yep. But I also had read about the LGBTQ yes. um, community as well. I didn't make a natural fit to that with the other two. But I'm curious, like, how did LGBT become part of this mission for you? For me, uh, growing up, I came out in twenty. I think I was twenty two. I think I was in college. And uh, uh, my uh, community, my background uh, is not very ex- as accepting of mm-hmm. uh, gay people. And uh, so it's very, very hard for me to make peace with the fact that I was gay. Uh, and uh, so when I was in college, uh, sophomore year, I almost committed suicide. Uh, I almost uh, just with everything that I had been through growing up in Rwanda, Zambia, and coming here, and I was finally living my dream. And at the time, I had already also started speaking about my survival story publicly. And now I'm, I was, this thought that I was gay scared me so much because I, I thought that everyone was going to reject me and, uh, I wasn't a good person and so forth. And, uh, so I got the courage to call someone and I talked to a friend who really helped me understand that there was nothing wrong with me, that I was okay. And uh, it also inspired me to go seek counseling uh, and met with this wonderful counselor at my university that I graduated from Southern Connecticut State University. And she really helped me understand that I was okay. There's nothing wrong with me. So through that experience of uh, having to feel, I think about some of the kids who come from similar countries as mine where um, their families are very homophobic. So the, the reasoning of why I advocate was because of my experiences. So I tried mm-hmm. to to represent, to uh, set a good example that you could be uh, someone who came here as a refugee. Uh, you could be from low income uh, background. You could be gay, you could be lesbian, you could be transgender, you could be bi. And you could do awesome things for the world. Mm-hmm. You could run your own company. You could uh, inspire the world. You could... Just exactly yeah, what yeah. you're doing. Yeah. I also know that you do speak um, at high schools and organizations and such. Um, what exactly are you doing and why are you doing that? Right, yeah. So um, many high schools and colleges uh, usually teach about uh, uh, th- different things that are going around the world. Uh, so for high school kids, they uh, teach us or teach us in their social studies. They cover the Rwandan genocide and other uh, genocides like the Holocaust and so forth. And usually they're looking for a survivor to come in and share real experiences. So they, people invite me to do that. And sometimes companies are looking for somebody to come 
inspire the employees on uh, how to uh, stay strong and not give up and not uh, um, uh, you know have faith, have hope. And so they bring in Daniel to come and <laughs> inspire them with my work and story and so forth. You know, let's say you say you don't have the time to volunteer, but you have the resources to donate. Donate, support an organization. You know, if you know you have a skill for how to technology, teach kids, like invite them to your office. If you have a job that is cool, uh, invite like a kid in your community to come check you out in action. Uh, if, uh, yeah, just opportunities. Give young people opportunities mm. that's going to help them build skills and uh, talent. I, I yeah. love that. I think that's yeah. the last part. I, I yeah. yeah, give them opportunities because right. I think it's, they don't know what they don't know. Right. Help right. them see yes. the bigger space, the yes. bigger world. Yes. So how can people get involved with your organization or help you guys? There are many ways uh, to get involved. One is simply connect with us on social media. We are on um, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. We have a YouTube show. <laughs> I was going to ask you about the YouTube show. <laughs> we have a YouTube show where I get to interview some of our students who have participated in our program. And so sometimes I get to interview uh, donors who have uh, uh, supported us, like Martin, who used his birthday to raise money for us. Or mm, Mar- I watched that episode. <laughs> yeah. I think that was like one of our best episodes, I think. <laughs> <laughs> if people have the means, make a one-time donation. And where can they donate? Uh, so our website, uh, www.danotrustfoundation.org. Well, this has been awesome. Thank you. Thank you for coming all the way out here. I know you're seeing a friend, but still, we no, worked this, it out. This this was amazing. I think this was meant to be. I do, but. too. I do, too. We just made this happen. <laughs> That's it for the episode. But hold on. Before you hit that stop button, here's a few more things you may not know about. Did you know I share other amazing stories, ideas, and creative spotlights each week? It's all to spark your imagination and power creativity. Just go to awesomefinds.info. That's A-W-E-S-O-M-E-F-I-N-D-S dot I-N-F-O to find out more and sign up. And it's, of course, all free. If you want original weekly articles that help you follow your passion, find your purpose, or to learn from other amazing people, check out the articles at accidentalinformation.com. If you want to share your feedback about this episode or the show, send us an email at info at accidentalinformation.com or call us at 1-707-347-9312. You can follow along with me and see behind the scenes of the show and my adventures. So come find me on Instagram and Twitter at me, Christopher. That's M-E-C-H-R-I-S-T-O-P-H-E-R. You can also follow along with Accidental Information on Instagram and Facebook at Accidental Information or on Twitter at Accidental Info. Lastly, if you love the show and want to help me out, I'd love it if you told a friend about the show, as in literally text someone or email it to them. I cannot tell you how awesome that would be. Also, writing a review for the show wherever you listen to podcasts helps in a really big way too. Thanks to everyone listening and joining me in my story. We'll talk again next week when we hear from another big, inspiring story.